Hello and welcome to Midweek Connection on July 27th, 2022. I'm Pastor Joel. And I'm Natalie. And we're here to do what we frequently do. We haven't done it for a couple weeks because I've been out on vacation and then various things going on. I don't even always know, but uh, it's good to be back together. We are going to read our lectionary texts for today and then have a little conversation about them. So let me open this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for... Uh, for this day. We thank you for the ways that you love us, ways that uh, we can only get little glimpses of from time to time uh, in our capacity to understand. But Lord, we trust and we believe that you love us uh, immeasurably in ways that we might not ever know this side of heaven. So thank you for loving us. And, and especially today, thank you for, for giving us your word that we can uh, read it and be edified by it. So I pray, Lord, that in all that we do and say today, that you would be glorified and that your church would be strengthened. And we thank you and praise you. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. We're going to start today with Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed, O you who answer prayer. To you all flesh shall come, when deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds, you answer us with deliverance, O God, of our salvation. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. By your strength, you establish the mountains. You are girded with might. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of their peoples. Those who live at earth's farthest bounds are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges softening it with showers and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. Psalm 147 verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem, he gathers the outcasts of Israel, he heals the brokenhearted, and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars, he gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord, and abundant in power, his understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden, he casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving, make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the speed of the runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Our Hebrew text today is from Judges chapter 3, verses 12 through 30. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened King Eglon of Moab against Israel, because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. In alliance with the Ammonites and the Malachites, he went and defeated Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms. So the Israelites served King Eglon of Moab eighteen years. But when the Israelites cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, son of Gera the Benjamite, a left-handed man. The Israelites sent tribute by him to King Eglon of Moab. Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he fastened it on his right thigh under his clothes. Then he presented the tribute to King Eglon of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. When Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent the people who carried the tribute on their way, but he himself turned back at the sculptured stones near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. 
So the king said, Silence! And all his attendants went out from his presence. Ehud came to him while he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber and said, I have a message from God for you. So he rose from his seat. Then Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into Eglon's belly. The hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not draw the sword out of his belly, and the dirt came out. Then Ehud went out into the vestibule and closed the doors of the roof chamber on him and locked them. After he had gone, the servants came. When they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought he must be relieving himself in the cool chamber. So they waited until they were embarrassed. When he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them. There was their Lord lying dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while they delayed and passed beyond the sculptured stones and escaped to Sirah. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. The Israelites went down with him from the hill country, having him at their head. Ehud said to them, Follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites and allowed no one to cross over. At that time, they killed about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men. No one escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest 80 years. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called, called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were, stay, where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. Our gospel text today is from Matthew 27, verses 45 through 54. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and 
and said, Truly, this man was God's son. Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, from this time on and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, so that the righteous might not stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their own crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. And our final psalm today is from Psalm 91. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Um, interesting passages today, as usual, um, and I'm always intrigued as to see how they're going to play out together. Uh, one of the things that I was thinking about, especially with the um, uh, interesting contrast, in my opinion, between, like, say, Psalm 91 and the Judges passage with Ahud, we and then there was uh, another one of the um, maybe it was Psalm 65, but this uh, talking about the whole idea about how uh, God will protect the people of God um, and God will judge the wickedness. And so, uh, but we know that even in Psalm 91, this uh, that line in there, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways was a line that the uh, the devil, while Jesus was in the wilderness, uh, takes out of context uh, and tries to then tempt Jesus to follow after, uh, follow after the devil rather than doing his thing. So combine that with the Matthew passage that talks about the death of Jesus on the cross. And so we see this interesting um, contrast between uh, protection for the righteous, judgment against the wicked, uh, but then we see Jesus, who was righteous, being essentially judged and killed, and and then uh, wickedness seeming to be triumphant. Um, so uh, I, I regularly try to figure out like what is what is it that God's trying to do in the midst of this? But that Ahab passage uh, from Judges is really one of those. Um, you know, brutally honest narrative <laughs> right. stories like, oh, King Eglon of Moab is a fat man and, you know, right. he gets stabbed in the belly and with this cubit long sword. With this cubit long sword. And, and it disappears. And it, it's got so many, exactly, you got 18 inches of sword and the hilt goes in and he doesn't draw it back out except the dirt comes out with it, which is euphemistic for, you know, internal gut stuff and right. uh, and then the servants come and they're like oh, he must be relieving himself and it's like then they get embarrassed because he's been in there for so long right. the whole thing is just it's almost it's almost uh, it's almost comedy of errors but uh, but it starts we, we start seeing in judges uh, this cycle of 
uh, starting there in verse 12, the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and then the Lord brought them up because they were doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord, brought up then King Eglon of Moab. Um, so there's this cycle that continues to happen in Judges where the people of God do wickedness, God brings some judgment upon them, they cry out to the Lord, the Lord saves them, there's peace and rest in the land for a time, and then repeat the cycle. The and every time it repeats, and I don't know how many times in Judges we might be, whether we'll still be here next week or something, but I will pretty much guarantee that that same cycle, that same, fear, that same theme will play out again. The same thing the same is playing out. Will play out again. Uh, which which just which which makes me think again that as much as God delivers the people for it says at this time they had the land had rest for eighty years right. they're they're delivered from King Eglon the the, the fat evil king um, but it's a temporary time of reprieve right. and then you look at what the consequences are for the death of Jesus. And how it actually brings eternal life right. and eternal peace for those who have faith in Christ. Right. Uh, but even with that, just the the narrative of you know dead coming out of the tombs, um, a, a taste of that which is to come, uh, and then the Acts passage where. Where, where Jesus is sending them out to be witnesses to that which has been accomplished. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm just kind of talking about, well, I'm just reviewing right. what we have. No, no insights into it other than, <laughs> you know, it's, it's this regular theme of God delivering his people. Uh, but the best of human intentions and the best of human capacity to deliver is only going to be temporary. Uh, where where Jesus, when he lays down his life willingly, brings the, the eternal peace that, that we so desperately want. Right. There's one thing about that Matthew passage that um, always kind of hits me um, when reading that. And, and I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm just going to throw it out there. Just throw it out so, there. <laughs> Jesus is on the cross. And and he is and he's dying and he's suffering, and he cries out to God and he says, "Why are you forsaking me?" He is God. He knows. He knows. He's been foretelling and prophesying and telling of you know I will rebuild the temple in three days. He knows that he's coming back. But I think for me, what that reveals is. The humanity of Jesus. I think so many times, I'll speak for myself, I don't know if other people, I think so many times we, when we read scripture, when we read the stories, we, um, we see Jesus as God, but we don't always see him as human, or at least for me, if you have to, if you look at him, do you think of him as God or human? And he was fully both of those, and really, and I don't know if I've shared this with you, but, um, one of my kids, you were you were preaching, you were reading, and, and and it wasn't Easter, but we were talking. Maybe it was this passage, and he looks up at me in the middle of the service, and he said, "Did Jesus feel pain?" And it made me stop, and I was like, "Yes, he was human. He felt everything that was being done, just as we as humans would be." And that really kind of opened my eyes to the humanity of Jesus, mm -hmm. because so many times. Um, in the past when I have read scripture and I think that we read it or in my context, in my lens, is always to see Jesus as God and he is. But sometimes it's easy for me to forget he was also fully human. Mm -hmm. And so when he cries out to God and he says, why, did you force, why are you forsaking me? Go back and read the Psalms. How many times do we go, God, you're forsaking us. God, you've turned your back on us even though he's never done that. And he didn't with Jesus either. He was there in the moments of the cross. But in the humanity mm. of Jesus suffering, that humanity becomes evident when he says, and he cries out, Father, why have you forsaken me? I mean, that is a human response. Right. Because the God, Jesus, Son of God, Jesus God, knows he's there. He is present in that moment. 
but the humanity feels that. I mean, I don't know. Like I said, I don't know if I'm reading that wrong. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I don't know if I'm expressing my thoughts on that. But right. that scripture always hits me. And like I said, after after Carson asked me that, I was like, okay, you know, I never thought of it that way. Right. <laughs> but well, and I think. Um, even if we connect, uh, no, I agree with you. Like the the full humanity of Jesus, where uh, you know he experienced a very human death on the cross, as as horrible and humiliating as as the Romans intended that to be, and had executed against other insurrectionists or thieves right. or rebels or whatever. It's like yes, he did experience those things, and uh, for those of us who. Um, you know, have lived lives absent great violence against us. It's right. hard for us to even imagine the amount of suffering that he went through. Um, and, and I think even if we, you know, connecting it again to the Ehud passage from Judges, where Judges has that sort of refrain again, the people did what was evil, God raised up a, you know, a king of, you know, a foreign country, whatever, to rule over them, and then he brings a deliverer. Um, if one jumps back to the beginning of Matthew, uh, what was the cry of the people at the beginning of Matthew? They were crying out for a savior, but we find that King Herod is ruling over this land, and King Herod is doing what is right in his own eyes. And, and so you've got comparable situations where I think um, uh, you know, this is the condition that humanity would face uh, and does face um, absent... Um, God's intervention. And so where where every human effort, even those that God raised up, you know, they, they could accomplish their purposes, but just to a limited extent. So it takes God himself. It takes the perfect human, the fully God, the fully man, to, to bear that price for us, uh, to then deliver us. And so uh, I, I think you're right. And so you know how does that how does that play into Psalm ninety one, where Psalm ninety one is very very real and true, and and God does provide protection for the people that follow after Him, yet He allows Jesus to go through that suffering on our behalf. Um, yeah, rich stuff. Uh, and then you know jumping back to the Acts passage, even just Acts chapter one, where they are all uh, marveling at the resurrected Jesus. We know that Matthew 27 is not the end of the story, that right. he does rise from the dead, and that he is sending the people out uh, to be his witnesses. Um, and, and it did take place at a specific time, a specific place with specific people, um, just as Ehud and Eglon were, you know, real people, specific times, specific places, that God is involved and invested in human right. history to accomplish his purposes. Um, yeah, always always fun stuff, challenging stuff. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know if you had anything further to add on any of these things. Um, you know, I, I think if uh, we didn't read for, uh, farther on into Acts, but uh, it's interesting that the next little passage is talking about how Judas is trying to repent of selling Jesus into slavery. And, you know, he hangs himself or falls headlong and it says, you know, in his bowels gushed out. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know, King Eglon, you know, it's just like all these, it's like humans have their problems. Right. <laughs> it's like, don't go that way. Don't, right. don't go that way. Repent of your wickedness. Uh, come before the Lord uh, in, in humility and and cry out to Him to be delivered. And, right. and, and ultimately, He does. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe we're just out of practice. This has been a couple <laughs> weeks, but uh, uh, you know, just again, and I, and for those who are watching, just uh, thank you so much for tuning in and things. But uh, this is just a reminder to everybody: continue to read Scripture, continue to believe that God can and does speak to all of us through his word uh, as, as the Holy Spirit gives us the understanding of these things. So all of these stories, you know, uh, you know they, they could be just interesting stories or familiar stories or challenging stories, but every single one of them plays into God's grand narrative arc where he 
he is bringing all things into uh, making all things new, bringing all things to their intended purpose. And so even the stories that when we might go, ah, it's kind of, kind of weird, you know, um, just pray about it and ask God, what, what are you doing here in the midst of the story and how can this, how can this affect my life in a positive way that I can love you more and then uh, be obedient to your call. So you want to you close us in prayer today, Natalie? I can do that. Great. Gracious Father, thank you for this time in your word. Thank you for your word to us. Um, I just pray that as we as we read your words and as we um, have opportunities to talk about them, not just today, but in the everyday, um, that you reveal to us um, what it is that you would have us to hear um, and reveal to us how you would have your words transform us and I just pray for each of us that um, that grand narrative, that grand arc of scripture, um, we are in the here and now, and we are in this place, and we do have a purpose. And whether we feel like our backs, um, our back is, is a, you know, we have turned our backs on you or whatever it is, I just pray that we can cry out to you and we can um, come back into uh, your arms back into your fold and that we may feel your presence in whatever situations that we are in and that we feel encouraged and we feel hopeful and know that um, your story is not over and that we will um, we can be a part of the fulfillment of your story and we can be a part of uh, sharing the gospel and the good news of your Christ in a world um, that so desperately needs to hear that. In, in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. We look forward to seeing you the next time we do this. Take care. Bye-bye.